Hello and welcome to Facebook. Uh, welcome to Salon Talks. Uh, my name is Andrew O'Hare. I'm the executive editor of Salon. This is a really exciting one today. Uh, somewhat of an inside job for those of us here at Salon. But to talk about one of the most important topics, not just in politics, but in uh, constructing American society and what we can do to redeem our democracy. Joining me on my far left is the former editor-in-chief of Salon and the author of the national bestseller, Rat Fucked. We can say that word on Facebook, apparently. Uh, Rat Fucked, Why Your Vote Doesn't Count. David Daly, welcome back, Dave. Pleasure to be here, especially on your far left. <laughs> on, yeah, far le it's hard to get on my far left, as you would as you Exactly. Would, you, can, you can testify. And joining us in the middle is Barrick Goodman, the co-director and producer of a film called Slay the Dragon, which is in part inspired by Dave's book. Is that an accurate? I would say largely inspired. Largely inspired by Dave's book. Good. So where there's no tension here, we're good. Okay. I hope not. All right, good. So uh, Barrick's film Slay the Dragon is premiering tomorrow night, at, if you're watching this live, but that would be this week at the Tribeca Film Festival. Is that right? Correct. And you are certainly hoping that we will see it in uh, theatrical distribution, streaming distribution, all the wonderful forms of distribution. Absolutely. But that yeah. remains to be determined. World premiere? World premiere, it? tomorrow night. Yeah. Uh, this week at the Tribeca Film Festival here in New York. I hope it isn't raining as hard as it is right now, uh, tomorrow night, but uh, welcome guys. So let's, Dave, Dave let's start with you. Um, I'm sure many of our viewers, readers, know about Rat Fucked, your book. It is about the issue of gerrymandering and redistricting, which on the surface is sometimes regarded as a boring topic, but in fact speaks to many of the problems in our democracy. As you say in the subtitle of your book, it's why your vote doesn't count. Um, and like many people, when I first heard you were writing this book, I was a little dubious, and then I saw where it was going, and I began to understand why it was so important. I think a lot of us misunderstood gerrymandering several years ago. We did uh, think that it was wonky or boring or dry, but we also, we also perhaps thought it was yesterday's news. Uh, there was the sense that Democrats had self-sorted themselves into these districts. Um, the big sort. Uh, the big yeah. sort, that it was geography, that it was natural clustering. Um, and really, I mean, I was at Salon and I was running our politics coverage every day, and I didn't fundamentally understand why Democrats didn't take back the U.S. House in 2012. Every day we were covering a government shutdown, we were covering the 50 some odd attempts to repeal Obamacare, we were covering the failure to even be able to get a conversation about gun control after kindergartners got massacred at Sandy Hook. And I looked up one day and I said, well, why didn't Democrats take back the House when we re-elected Barack Obama, when Democrats took the, the U.S. Senate, and oh, it turns out the Democrats got 1.4 million more votes in 2012 than nationally. Republican candidates yeah. nationally. Um, and then I looked at individual states, and I said, wait a second. How is it possible that Pennsylvania sends 13 Republicans and five Democrats? How is it possible that Ohio sends 12 Republicans and four Democrats? That uh, North Carolina is 10 Republicans and three Democrats? And I kept kind of looking back, and I found this Republican strategy called Red Map, which is short for the uh, redistricting majority project that a handful of savvy Republican <coughs> strategists assemble really in the after effect of the 2008 election. Yes. When they, when Republicans thought that they might be in the uh, minority for the, in the country for a generation, they realized that 2010 was actually the truly consequential election because that's a redistricting year. We redraw all the lines across the country, state legislatures and in Congress. And what they did was they invested $30 million in a program to flip state legislatures, little local races around the country in Ohio and Michigan and Pennsylvania and North Carolina. And they flooded these races with millions of dollars of late dark money. They took control of these chambers. They, the following year, draw these radical lines with the help of supercharged technology and big data. And our politics has not been the same at the local level or the national level ever since. Now, some people may want to jump ahead to say, well, look at the 2018 midterms. Democrats gained 40 seats. There's, it may even turn out to be 41. We have one undecided mm -hmm. race still. Uh, doesn't that mean the problem is not as bad as that? But I know you know the answer to this. Right. If we had something <laughs> approximating fair districting, Meaning that we're not jobbing the Republicans, we're, sure. we're giving both parties a, a, a sort of 
fair shot at this. What do you think the 2018 distribution would have been in the House if we had fair districting? Oh, uh, well, the amazing thing about 2018 is that in the most gerrymandered states in the country, Wisconsin, North Carolina, Ohio, a blue wave hit and not a single seat changed hands. Uh, so it's still 12-4 in Ohio. It's still 10-3 in North Carolina. It's still 5-3 in Wisconsin. The only states where you saw a change, uh, two seats in Michigan uh, flipped in the most gerrymandered states in the country in the fourth year of these gerrymandered maps, in, in the uh, fourth election cycle fourth election, right. of these gerrymandered maps. That is not the sign of a gerrymander being a defeated. That is the sign of a really effective and enduring gerrymander. If you look at this at the state legislative level, it is even a more dramatic. 220,000 more votes for Democratic candidates statewide in Wisconsin. Democrats gained one assembly seat, and they cut the Republican advantage there to 63-36. This is in a year which Democrats sweep all of the statewide offices, right. the governor, governor a, attorney general, a U.S. Every, senator, yeah. everything else. They pick up one seat in the state assembly. Um, and what Democrats were able to do in 2018 it was first of all, many of these gerrymanders had been o overturned by the courts. Right. So Pennsylvania becomes a 9-9 state after the state a Supreme Court finds those maps unconstitutional. Which a neutral observer would say is probably about right. That's what it should be. Yeah. You know, it's a, it's a competitive 50-50 state, so it ought to be 9-9. It had been a locked-in 13-5, so Democrats gained four seats there. Uh, there were new maps drawn in Florida. There were new maps drawn in uh, Virginia. And when you, uh, Democrats made gains in 2018, three quarters of the seats that uh, were flipped were drawn by courts or by commissions. So they were able to thread the needle and win the, the handful of seats that they needed to take back the majority, but they remain at a serious detriment uh, nationwide. And these are the maps that they'll be competing on in 2020 as well. Right. And uh, we, we use the term partisan gerrymandering yes. because they're, they're, uh, the courts have been very um, direct in most cases about striking down obvious cases of racial gerrymandering. Um, we mostly don't exactly see that, although there is certainly some crossover because of the tendency of African-American voters to vote Democratic. Absolutely. But partisan ger gerrymandering remains a problem that the courts haven't completely addressed. You've written about this a lot. We did just see a, 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 a decision come down in Michigan. What are, what are the consequences of that? It's an amazing a decision. Um, a Michigan now follows the uh, state the Supreme Court ruling uh, in Pennsylvania and then the uh, federal court rulings out of Wisconsin and North Carolina. It becomes the fourth state to have struck down completely a map as an unconstitutional partisan gerrymander. They called it a gerrymander of historic proportions. This gerrymander in Michigan had been so effective, not only had it locked in Republican control of the congressional delegation, even in years in which Democrats won a quarter of a million more votes statewide, but Democrats have won control of the state house well, excuse me, Democrats have won the popular vote in Michigan for, for the State House 2012, 2014, 2016, and 2018. Yeah. Do you want to guess how many of those years they've actually won more seats? Not a single None. one of them. Right. Um, so, so what you have here now is another case headed to the U.S., the Supreme Court. Yes. These cases immediately go to the Supreme Court on appeal. And so it stands in line behind the North Carolina and Maryland cases that right. we expect a ruling in in June. And I think we ought to be excited about this ruling. It comes from a bipartisan panel of judges. But the real ruling on this is going to come in June, and it's going to be up to John Roberts and Brett Kavanaugh. Yes, yeah, which, which is a very interesting problem. I'll and, let you. And yeah. yeah, I'm not sure I feel optimistic can, about that, but... You guys can do the math about how that may turn out. We don't know. In, in fairness, we don't know. We Robert, don't know. Roberts has shown some waffle on this. Is that fair to say? Roberts showed more openness than I thought in the oral arguments. In the past, he has very much not wanted to invest what he sees as the impartial integrity of the courts for calling balls and strikes by having to <laughs> decide like when phrase. there's too much politics involved in, in drawing a map. 
John Roberts may be the last person in the country who actually believes his own bullshit. Um, <laughs> if we can say rat fucked, I'm assuming. We can say that. We can definitely. say bullshit. Yeah. Um, uh, Brett Kavanaugh actually did seem a little bit offended by the gerrymander in Maryland, which is, which the, is the one, one gerrymander in the country. I was going to say, why? Yeah. The single district in, in the nation that you can really point to as a democratic gerrymander. Which it um, was, let's just say which that. Which it, it was. absolutely was, and I've yeah. written about it extensively. Um, Democrats attempted to draw a map that would give them all eight of Maryland seats. When the incumbents realized that yeah. might be cutting it a little bit too thin, a fishy. they said, let's go for 7-1. And so they did a 7-1 map, and they, they, they turned Maryland 6 completely inside out. This offended the delicate notion of Brett Kavanaugh, um, and he did see the problem here. Whether he will be willing to do something about it would be amazing. Uh, it would also be deeply ironic if it is the one Democratic <laughs> gerrymander of the 2010 cycle that actually leads to the first ruling by the Supreme Court that partisan gerrymandering is unconstitutional. In a way, we would have Maryland's corrupt Democratic Party <laughs> machine to thank. For, we would. For thank you, Martin O'Malley. <laughs> <laughs> the first time anybody's ever said that. Uh, Barrett, Barrett Goodman, tell me about how you got from reading Dave's book to deciding to make a documentary about it, which let me just say to people, I mean, this is premiering at Tribeca, nobody's really gotten to see it yet, but if you think that a movie about redistricting and gerrymandering might be boring, you are wrong. This movie really speaks to the crisis in our democracy. How did you get from what Dave's reporting to making a film? Well, I think all of us have that experience in our lives of reading a book that really changes us. Uh, and, you know, Fast Food Nation, The Jungle. I honestly, <laughs> the that's, jungle. That's, wow. I mean, that's the kind of experience I had reading Dave's book. I, I knew very little about Jerry Manning. I think maybe I'd heard of the phrase and kind of had a vague idea. I was absolutely shocked by what I read. Um, I think because, like a lot of people, you know, we know that the parties disagree with each other. We we have our personal political views, but we tend to think that elections are basically fair, that basically everyone's vote counts the same. And this was absolutely, and it sounds incredibly naive now, but several years ago, that's what I sort of thought. Uh, and then I read this book and I was uh, just floored. So I immediately called David and um, no one had optioned the book yet and, and, and Dave was, was kind enough to, to come aboard our project. We ended up going with Participant Media, a wonderful mm -hmm. company that yeah. makes very, very good films. But it was clear to us that we needed to move beyond the story of Project Red Map, which is definitely a major part of our film, to the story of those people who are fighting back. And particularly, we, we focus on two big stories. One, a state-level ballot referendum, which was originated by a young woman named Katie Fahey, who had never done anything in politics. She was 27 years old, got up one day and said, I'm going to do something about this issue, galvanized an a, a incredibly inspiring grassroots movement in Michigan bipartisan, ordinary people out there every day in every weather, getting signatures, getting it on the ballot, overcoming every possible obstacle you can think of uh, that was thrown at them by the, by the entrenched power in Michigan. Um, really inspiring. The other made story we tell is the story of this, of what became the, the Gill case that went to the Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. At the time we began following it, it was still at the state level. And the lawyers and plaintiffs that brought this case, equally passionate, equally uh, inspiring folks and, and what's the what's the sub the, the text or the, the subject of that case just so the case is, comes out of Wisconsin it involves the, the the state level maps in Wisconsin which as Dave explained are incredibly gerrymandered um, what that story what makes that story really a great political suspense story a sort of political thriller is that they were able to excavate essentially during the lawsuit the the sort of tick tock of how these maps were done in secret by a very small group of co political consultants yeah. and managed by getting sort of a forensic uh, computer expert to sort of dig into the hard drives that were used during the, during the mapping process, and which were, by the way, they tried to erase them, but this guy was able to find files within them. They were able to reconstruct the process, which showed this very cynical sort of testing of limits. How can we draw these maps ever more part in an ever more partisan way to ensure ourselves X number of seats, no matter what, even if there's a huge Democratic wave, and there was one in 2018, yeah. we'll still have 60 seats in the legislature. And guess what? They nailed it. <laughs> and, and so we tell the story and how um, these folks brought this case. They won at the state level in a very inspiring 
way, and then it went to the Supreme Court, where it was promptly punted by the yes. Roberts Court. Um, so those are the sort of stories we tell in the same film. And talk, either, <laughs> either one of you guys, I guess I'll, I guess I'll start with, with you, Dave. Talk about the connections between the uh, gerrymandering issue, and let's talk about the kind of stuff that we saw, for example, in the Stacey Abrams race in Georgia, where the nation was startled and to some extent disconcerted by the degree of apparent voter suppression, uh, signs of possible um, illegal voter suppression, a guy who was the Secretary of State administering the election in which he himself was running for governor and wound up winning a very narrow victory, because my sense is clear that these things are conceptually linked, but to what extent is that kind of all part of a, of a, of a power strategy? I think that there's a lot of different threads in what you're talking about here. But I would say that the very first thing that gerrymandered legislatures do is they make it harder to vote in their states. So if you look at North Carolina, if you look at Pennsylvania, if you look at Michigan, Wisconsin, the spread of voter ID laws across this country since 2012 um, across 25 states, uh, 24 of them being Republican trifecta states, um, what you begin to see is that gerrymandering is the first step of the process when it comes to trying to entrench yourself in power. The next thing you do is try to pass voter ID laws that then cull the, the electorate down. The next thing you might do is eliminate days of early voting. Um, or make it harder to vote absentee. Um, seen all of those in things. some yeah. of these yeah. states, yeah. in Ohio, in North Carolina, they have done this so much that a federal court in North Carolina said that, that this was done surgically, that they specifically targeted the kinds of IDs that African Americans were least likely to have mm -hmm. and uh, demanded uh, uh, those, or that they specifically identified the days in Ohio in which North and in North Carolina, which African Americans were most likely <coughs> to vote early, and then eliminated exactly those days of voting. In North Carolina, what they did was uh, they had um, uh, county election boards that govern elections there, and ordinarily the governor is able to appoint uh, the members of that. In North Carolina, uh, they said, what we're going to do is alternate years. How about if we take all the even years and you get all the odd years. Hmm, what's the problem here? Elections are held in the even years. <laughs> um, so it's those county election boards, in turn, in North Carolina, in Georgia, that then determine how many precincts are opened, how many m machines each of those precincts get. And y you see not only in Georgia, but in in Kansas, in many states around the country, especially where secretaries of state were administering their own races for governor, um, like Brian Kemp was in Georgia, like Chris Kobach was in Kansas, you see how immediately the precincts start closing. Um, you know, Georgia wanted to close seven of the nine precincts in one African American uh, town. It was only when people stood up and fought back. And this, is, I think, is what is so inspiring about this film and this moment, is that around the country, people are recognizing the importance of this. They're understanding that this is not wonky, that this is the, the bread and butter of democracy, is the ability to actually get to the polls and cast a meaningful a ballot in a genuinely competitive election, and that it is systematically being taken away from us, and we are systematically standing up one by one and fighting back. The fact that, that Chris Kobach, who was before running for governor right in Kansas, was the head of Trump's so-called voter <laughs> fraud commission, um, the fact that he was the, sec the secretary of state and running all this stuff and still lost in a really in a state that has been dominated by Republicans for the last 30 years, I thought was, it was a sign of this, right? That some Kansas voters, in, in, including presumably a lot of registered Republicans, said, you know, I can't go there. In Michigan, the redistricting, the reform passes with 62% of the vote. In Florida, a Proposition 4 giving the right to vote back to formerly convicted felons passes with 64% of the vote. In 2018, a redistricting a reform passes in Ohio, it passes in Utah, it passes in Colorado, it Missouri. passes in Missouri. This yeah. is not a partisan issue 
as at, seen by voters. At the ground level, yeah. Voters yeah. want their votes to count, elections to be fair, and the side with the most votes to win. Politicians are trying to entrench themselves in power and rig those rules. Yeah. To what extent is this intersect? I mean, the way you just framed it is, is uh, politicians trying to, to entrench their power, and I think that's accurate. But to what extent does this intersect with what has been referred to as uh, the new Jim Crow, as an attempt essentially to uh, disenfranchise perhaps first and foremost black people, but probably also Latinos who tend to disproportionately vote for Democrats, and uh, particularly in the case of Latinos, are a, are a growing demographic in many places. I, I note that in Kansas, we did a couple stories about this, in the town of Dodge City, which is uh, more than half uh, Latino population, they moved the one polling place out of town to out a- Out of Dodge. Uh, literally out of Dodge, <laughs> literally out of Dodge, to, I believe, a, a shopping mall in the suburbs that was not served by the public bus That's system. exactly right. That's exactly so right. So how, how much overlap is there actually between kind of- uh, I think it is all deeply connected. I mean, listen, Republicans had a choice after 2008. Um, uh, they could have looked at the changing demographics of this nation and crafted policies that tried to appeal. Right. Um, or they could uh, take the path that they chose, which was uh, a gerrymandering voter suppression and putting up barriers between the public and the ballot. It's a deeply cynical strategy. We see it at work across the country. Um, you see it at work now. Um, I mean, in Michigan right now, the Michigan Senate is attempting to uh, take away uh, the funding for the Secretary of State's office in order to actually implement the commission that 62% of Michigan voters said that they want for a redistricting in Florida. Um, they are literally going back to old Jim Crow tactics and instituting a poll tax for the 1.4 million former felons who were given their right to vote back by 64% of Floridians, a supermajority in Florida, in a year in which Republicans elect a governor and a U.S. senator of that party. Uh, still, 64% of the people said no, these folks have paid their debt to society, yes. and now they're trying to add all kinds of draconian fines and fees in a state that uh, practices cash register justice in the, in the most brutal ways to make it even more difficult for people to vote. You talk about Jim Crow. Uh, There's a story that we tell in the film. In North Carolina, the way in which the gerrymander was achieved was by packing African Americans into mm -hmm. what they call majority-minority districts. The line in the congressional line in Greensboro, North Carolina, cuts across the heart of the historical black university there. Just it divides it into seven of the dorms on one side, uh, six on the other, the library on one side, the cafeteria. It's not subtle. On the other, it not is. Subtle. It's not subtle. Not subtle. But uh, Barrick, you, it, it seems like you really try to do the combination, which is in in many successful documentaries that that are about activists or activism, I think of Food Inc. to cite sure. the, we would love to have the success that that Indeed, a participant <laughs> media film. Yes, yes. yes. Um, that you're, you're trying to outline a very serious problem, but also present the idea that there are solutions and right. there is hope and right. you're not gonna bump people out at the end of the movie, right? And, and that's more than a contrivance, there is hope. And David has has covered it extensively. There, there are ordinary people fighting this, uh, they recognize what's happening, which is the first step, um, because this has all taken place in hiding behind closed doors, and now we have to drag it out. We hope our film will help drag it out into the light. Um, and, and it's very inspiring to see it, 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 you know, there's a problem here, though, because the, the ordinary means of fighting this would be through the ballot box. But the problem is that this is exactly <laughs> yeah. where the stuff is targeted. Yeah. There's a great line in the Michigan decision that just came out, which basically pointed a finger right at the Supreme Court and said, justice is, clearly that, that was intentional, we cannot allow, we, we the courts cannot allow this abridgment of, 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 civil, of, of voting rights to, to stand and hope that somehow it'll be cleared up by some magic in, in, in you know, in the ballot box, because it won't. It has, the courts in many states are the only recourse really left. There yeah. aren't ballot referenda possibilities in many states. So to get around this problem, we need the courts, we need the Supreme Court to step up. Otherwise, this is gonna continue to be a problem, I think you would agree, going into the next decade. You know, we just saw um, 
we just saw a report published last week about um, the President of the United States and his campaign, let's say, cooperating at arm's length with uh, foreign agents who were trying to influence the election. And it's, it's, we could sit here and debate for hours the significance of that and, and what impact it had. Um, I think everybody is, is disturbed and disconcerted to, re to read that information. It's very serious, and a lot of that has been dragged into the light now. We probably will never know whether um, Trump would have won the election uh, without, the, without the Russians being involved, and we'll never know exactly how many votes they were able to move. But I would put it to you guys that what you're talking about here is 10 times more important because it's more deeply entrenched, and we don't know for sure that the Russians elected Donald Trump. We do know for sure the effect that redistricting has had on democracy. This is what we've done to our own democracy. This is not what the Russians have done to us. This is what we ourselves have done. I mean, I've said it before. I mean, if this, if our democracy is a horror film, the call is coming from inside <laughs> this house. We have done this. We have to fix it. That's so, that's tremendous. Uh, listen, thank you guys so much for coming by. This is David Daly, my former boss, the former editor-in-chief of Salon and the author of the national bestseller, Rat Fucked, Why Your Vote Doesn't Count. If you haven't uh, read it, please do so. And uh, Barrett Goodman, the co-director and producer of the new film Slay the Dragon, which premieres this week at Tribeca Film Festival and which I'm sure you'll get a chance to see down the line. Barrett, Dave, thank you so much. Thank you thank so you. much. Appreciate it.